We have delegations coming from all over the world to try to find what we put in the water that create this kind of a hotbed of startups. Energy is not a luxury, it's a necessity, especially in a country like Israel where our ethos is built around a startup nation. If you want algorithms to run, if you want computers to run. You need power. You need power. So Iran, we're at the heart of the beast, and this is what sets this station apart from other stations. Yes. You hit the jackpot, and it's transformed the region. My children, your children's children Absolutely. will reap the benefit of this. Absolutely. When we think about the miracle of God, the miracle of the return of the Jewish people to the land, God brought the people of Israel to a neighborhood which was surrendered by enemies. Suddenly, 70 years later, Israel becomes a startup nation. I believe that a part of being a light to the nation, a part to be a testimony of the goodness of God, is the fact that Israel is a startup nation. God brought us into a neighborhood that was surrounded by enemies. And because of that, the people of Israel had to be creative. We didn't have a choice. I personally believe that God himself gave a supernatural wisdom to the Jewish people in order to be leading in technology, in innovation, in order to survive here in this region and to be a light to the nations. Let us watch together the miracle of Israel as a startup nation. Often people imagine Israel in the Middle East to be this desert, desolate, camel-ridden land. But in reality, this is what Israel looks like. Most of this country is at the forefront of the technological world. But it wasn't always this way. Just a couple generations back, this country was way behind the rest of the world. And in a short span of time, brilliant people from around the world that have come to this land and invested have pulled us out of that place and into the forefront of the technological world. It has always been the case that the Jewish people have been very learned, scientific, and engaged. Now bring it to the 21st century. The same thing happens when you have people inventing things. The gap between the brain and the machine is going to be narrowed with this kind of technology. People constantly come to Israel looking for the magic formula. How can we buy this? How can we manufacture it? How can we duplicate it? How can we copy it? You can't copy a culture. You're looking back into the Jewish psyche and saying that same mindset, that same philosophy, that same, let's call it addiction almost to, uh, to learning and thinking and challenging as a culture, that translated into the modern state of Israel. Israel has earned its nickname as the startup nation. With around 6,500 active startups, Israel has the most startups per capita in the entire world. What's even more impressive is that per capita, it outranks every other country in the number of unicorns or companies worth more than $1 billion. Today, Israel's tech industry makes up 9% of the workforce and it shows no signs of slowing down. We're heading towards Tel Aviv to meet with Yossi Valdi. And Yossi Valdi is, for all matters and effects, the father of the Israeli startup nation. I mean, this is the guy who's been here before anyone else. Whether he was a founder or he invested in them in the seed phase, this guy has been behind an endless list of successful startup ventures in this country. I wanted to talk a bit about you, Yossi, the person. What does the uh, executive uh, brief on, on Yossi Valdi sound like? I was what is called today a nerd, a chnun. <laughs> I worked in the development labs of the Ministry of Defense. After two years, I created one of the earliest software companies in Israel. What year is this? This was 69. In a few years, it became the largest in Israel. Don't be too impressed, because when we reached 300 people, we were the biggest one. <laughs> Eventually, I invested in like 86 different companies. 33 of them I've done exit. And not less important, 30 of my investment went bust, lost the money, were closed, created for me agony, embarrassment. As Truman said, if you cannot stand the heat, don't go to the kitchen. Yossi has been modest. Yossi told us the miracle. He said, two-thirds search results, one-third 
that. And there we have it. In addition to founding Tekim, one of Israel's first and four-time largest software companies, he was prominent in the success of Answers.com, Israel's national oil company, several successful public companies, including Israel's largest energy company, and the world's first instant messaging software, ICQ, which sold to AOL in 1998 for $407 million. The history of the high-tech in Israel starts in order to resolve critical national issues, not in order to do exits or to... Not to make money. Yeah. Yossi's personal success is part of Israel's unprecedented history of going from zero to 60, economically and technologically speaking, in a very short amount of time. And he took me through the entire story. We had to develop agriculture in order to create food. We had to resolve the water issues, and we had major defense challenges. Then there was Yom Kippur War, which was a very traumatic war for us. So the army moved very fiercely and created the, what is known today the elite units of the intelligence. The 90s, we began to see the high-tech as we know it today. The government realized the need to encourage international VCs to team with local financial people. This was the first big money which came to Israel. In the 1990s, the tech scene here exploded and it hasn't stopped growing. Many have speculated about the reasons for Israel's entrepreneurial success. But if you truly want to understand what created the startup nation, you have to look even deeper. Just to give an idea of the scope of the phenomena, last year, the activity in Israel of startups measured by dollar sums was one quarter of the total of Europe and Israel together. Like wow. one, yeah. So we are a country of nine million people. It doesn't add up. Yeah, it's quite surprising. The question is what we have here that is not available in other countries, which create this very unique uh, proposition. This has to do with the cultural DNA of the people, heritage, what the young kids get at home. And you have to remember that behind every Israeli kid, there is one of the mightiest forces in the world, and this is the Jewish mother, which push him from the age of six to go and excel. She don't forget to tell them, after all we have done for you, asking you to bring one Nobel Prize is really not too much. So that's, <laughs> that's the culture, this is how we grow. More than that, you know, if you want to understand Israel, you have to think in tribal terms. Mm -hmm. We spend time in the army, which creates this feeling of joint destiny, which forces you to collaborate and to help other people. We're driving through downtown Jerusalem on our way to meet with a very unique and important person in the city, Erel Margalit, who is the founder of JVP, one of the biggest VCs, venture capital funds in this country. This person is at the core of making business happen, and not only is he doing it in Israel, he's doing it in downtown Jerusalem. That is something that sets him apart from the pack. Defining and understanding what you want to do in your life is the hardest thing. You think that how you're gonna get there is the hardest thing. No. Defining where you wanna go. If you find the path to yourself, mm -hmm. you'll find the path to anywhere in the world. That's how I was able to help create great companies where companies were about to be sold for 100 million and we turned them into 6 billion, 7 billion because we allowed ourselves another part of the journey to connect in a greater way to the world. Unlike most of Israel's startup industry, JVP is based in Jerusalem, not Tel Aviv, and they have just recently established here in Jerusalem what they call Margalit Startup City. You're sort of the, the poster boy for startup and investment in Israel, but your upbringing wasn't, didn't set you up for this. My father was a community center manager. My mother was an educator, a teacher. It wasn't trivial, you know, to find a job, to make mm -hmm. a living. Uh, and I remember when I told my wife that I'm going to leave the job that I then had in the municipality or the Jerusalem Development Authority and go create a venture capital fund when people didn't know how to spell venture capital in Israel. I told her it's probably going to take a few months. I'm not going to have any income. 
But I believe that the way we're going, this is going to be a great thing. Not everybody around us were convinced, uh, but she said, you know what? Go for it. But, you know, I was very lucky. Is luck the right word? I think an entrepreneur has uh, a certain quality about them. They see reality as it is, they imagine it to be different, and they think they could affect the change. Sometimes they're right, sometimes they're wrong. Grace needs to touch you because there's so many things working against a new idea, a new venture. Eril found the grace and the new reality he was looking for. Today, with over 1.4 billion raised across eight funds and a vast network of partners throughout the world, JVP has taken lead on some of the largest and most impressive exits out of Israel and has been recognized over and over with awards and accolades. And now Eril is starting something new. Many people know you for, that's called the business success, but you're focused on the education and on bringing up the next generation almost more than anything else. Yes. What, what is that? What are you trying to achieve? What I'm focused on is not only the great centers of excellence of today, mm -hmm. but some of the great centers of excellence of tomorrow. That's the idea of Margalit's Startup City. When you come in and you have a great idea to transform your region, but to involve everyone. Do it with a community and create 30, 40, 50,000 jobs, which pay a high salary. Hey. Hey, Pnina. Hi, Good to see you. Good to see Thank you. Thank you for having Welcome. us. As part of Eril's vision, JVP's headquarters are in a vast campus that they call Margalit Startup City Jerusalem, a multifaceted campus that houses essentially an entire startup ecosystem and combines it with social and cultural initiatives and innovators from around the country. So far, they have active startup cities in Jerusalem, Be'er Sheva, and New York. Welcome to the JVP and the Margalit Startup City, um, Jerusalem. I explored their main campus with Pnina, JVP's VP of Marketing. We have Accelerator, we have Labs, we have the VC, connecting all the dots together. This is the secret of this uh, beautiful and inspiring uh, place. We'll meet a few of uh, the entrepreneurs that are coming from Jerusalem and the area of Jerusalem. So this is uh, a workstation that mm -hmm. is now testing a performance of a driver under the influence of alcohol. The system will detect if you are above the threshold mm -hmm. without measuring your blood alcohol content. Would you like to try our simulator? Sure. Basically, you need to maintain the right lane. And cars are, yeah. Oh, there, I already had an accident. The system indicates that officially, even though you didn't drink, you drive as a drunk driver. My wife would agree with you. <laughs> What do you guys do? What are you up to? We are a language company. We're assessing the English capability, so, writing spoken language. So if we have or hire another thousand employees in one day, we could assess all those employees in a few minutes. Awesome. Working here in Jerusalem, you could look just outside the window over here, you see a 3,000 year old city mm -hmm. of Jerusalem. Kind of thinking about the technologies that we're working with there, the spear of the technology. So it's like the upper Jerusalem with the lower Jerusalem and combining them both together. So it's definitely a, it's an, a very good way to put it. Thank you. Creating a vibrant startup hub in Jerusalem is no easy task. But for Ariel and his team at JVP, it's an integral part of their vision for the future of Israel. I think the question has to go back to why? What are you trying to achieve? I'm trying to use the light mm -hmm. and to tie it between our nation and other nations. Let us be a light onto the nation. I'm finding my way to fulfill a prophecy, which I feel is ingrained within me. We remember a time where Isaiah was standing here, looking at the men who were slaughtered, the women and children taken out of Jerusalem. At the greatest time of crisis of our people, he came with one of the greatest vision mm -hmm. that is still with us in our time, a light onto the nations. This city will be a city of light, and many nations will come, and they will see our God as their God and they will come from around the world, and this will be a great center. I don't see Israel just as a startup nation. I see Israel as a creative center mm -hmm. of the world, where the spiritual and the technological and the storytelling and the ability to touch and to do well, tikkun olam, the mending of the world. As Israel rose from the ashes of the Holocaust into an ongoing struggle for survival, we've emerged to be a beacon of technological light to the world. This is the story of the Israeli startup nation, 
Israel being the light of God shining to the world. And the future looks bright. The important thing is to let more people enjoy this prosperity. Let it percolate into the society. This is the one thing all of us should do it. The whole idea of this place is actually to bring entrepreneurs from Jerusalem and now Jerusalem to start and build their ideas. We work together. And if everybody that feels mm -hmm. such positive things about mm -hmm. Jerusalem will bring their positivity and creativity, mm -hmm. then something from here will be larger than what technology can do alone. Shalom. With us today is Dr. Ami Applebaum, Israeli chief scientist. Dr. Applebaum, what a great honor to have you with us. Great to be here. The position of uh, the chief scientist in Israel, it's a unique position. Chief scientist is basically the arm for the government to promote research and development in Israel. Mm -hmm. If we got the name of Startup Nation, a lot of it is attribute to the activities that the government of Israel started more than 40 years ago. To take public fund, public money, and invest it in the private sector for research and development. So if I understand properly, young Israelis are coming to the chief scientists, they have an idea. You guys are deciding if this idea has a merit or doesn't have a merit. Yes, and what's interesting is that I would say more crazy it sounds and higher the risk, more than we tend wow. to give him the money. We want to take the highest risk because that's the highest reward. What makes Israel unique and what do you think Israel got to the point that it's called a startup nation. In order to have this startup nation, you need a full ecosystem. First, you need the government, and we talked about it. Second, you need the strong academia and strong education system. Mm -hmm. You need the atmosphere of entrepreneurship mm -hmm. and somebody that will take those entrepreneurs that no one will fund them, that to give them fund. You need the global companies because you want technology, you want people to be exposed mm -hmm. to technology. Companies like IBM came here many, many years ago. KLA came here, Intel came here. Last and not least, Israel Defense Force. The fact that every young Israeli at 18 years old knows that he'd go to the military. When you have to make life and death decision, your mindset is changing immediately. Mm -hmm. You learn to work with, uh, in a group. You learn discipline. And let me tell you a story. I was sitting, as I sit opposite you, with the CEO of Daimler-Benz. Daimler-Benz, the Mercedes, the, the, the best of Germany uh, industry. And he come to Israel. I, why do you come here? And he said, and I know that if I will not be here in Israel, I will not have access to all the cyber technology, to all the sensors that you guys are providing, and I will have no company tomorrow. Mm. And if you see all the large company, now you have to ask yourself, if I'm an investor, if I'm a VC, can I afford not to be where all of this happened? And I but see, I would tell you, I would ask you, why not India? Because what you find in Israel is out of the box mm. uh, thinking, what many people are familiar with the term, with the chutzpah. Hmm. The Bible tells us that Israel will be a light to the nations. How do you see it? What I think we do is provide the world a most uh, human a solution to all problems. And we believe that Israel should be one of the leaders. It makes the world a mm -hmm. better place to live. Dr. Applebaum, thank you very much. It was very interesting. And to you, our friend, stay with us for another Inside Israel and the Middle East. I met up with Khulud Ayuti and Ariel Rosen to learn about the organization Present Tense. I'm Khulud Ayuti, I'm from Jaffa, and I am Muslim Arab. Hi, I'm Riela Rosen, I'm from Jerusalem, and I'm Jewish Israeli. And to see how they're working to make sure the startup nation is accessible for everyone in the country. We try to help those left behind enjoy the fruits of the startup nation. We focus on diversifying the startup nation by running programs for communities, not taking part of the startup nation. Who in Israel is underrepresented? Like the Arab community, like the ultra-Orthodox Jewish community. Women are also a social periphery. What is the, the origin of this 
discrepancy. One thing that we clearly see is the understanding of what entrepreneurship is. This lack of awareness definitely is what is keeping their population of thriving in the ecosystem. The Jewish ultra-Orthodox men and women we work with, they don't necessarily have the same education mm. as someone from a different background. There's lack of connections, of course. So what we try to do is also link and bridge the communities that we work with with the startup nation. Many of the people from these diverse communities don't even know the opportunity exists and have no idea where to begin. Our main program is our Accelerator, which mm -hmm. is basically a very intense program for teaching practices of entrepreneurship. The first thing that we do when we enter a new community is to recruit someone from the community. So mm -hmm. a local coordinator or a program manager. And basically this person will do whatever it takes to get people to come to our uh, events. The diverse team at Present Tense are able to see the lack and bridge the gap. We focus on having a strong sense of yourself and then what your startup is while we try to start connecting them to people. 60% of the entrepreneurs who did go through our program uh, have sustainable startups. Hebrew 13.16 says, Do not forget to do good and to share with others, for with such sacrifices God is pleased. Present Tense is doing just that by sharing the knowledge and the path to startup success with all of Israel's population. They have regular meetings with their participants to get updates and to encourage one another. The team at Present Tense is really making an impact, and their program would no doubt be less impactful if Khulud and Ariela were not driven by passion and personal motivation. Up until uh, four years ago when I began working at Present Tense, I had no idea what the Startup Nation was. I have two daughters. In the end of the day, I want my daughters to live in a place where, where they have the same uh, equal opportunity that any kid who grows up in Tel Aviv had. I have a philosophical question for you. Why does this organization exist? We need to exist as long as the gaps exist, as long as there's such deep socioeconomic gaps in society. And any business world is a closed industry, an excluded industry. We need organizations like ours. After the miracle of the return of the Jewish people to the land, the people of Israel had to deal with a land that had nothing, a desolate country. Today, 70 years later, Israel became one of the leading country in so many fields, but especially in the field of energy. The Bible tells us to be a light to the nation by presenting the Messiah of Israel to the nation, but also to be a light in technology. And today, Israel is a source of energy to Egypt, to Jordan, to the country around us. So let us watch together the miracle of energy in the land of the Bible. Pretty much everything we do in everyday life depends on one thing, available energy. And for us in Israel, the concept or the idea of being dependent on our neighbors for our available energy is something quite unsettling. We have to be able to stand alone on our own resources in this country. As a Christian Zionist and a New Covenant believer, Isaiah 65.1, the calling to render assistance to the Jewish people in a nation of Israel and to help the people of Israel maintain their political and economic independence. Coal, fuel oil, all came over to Israel via containers. None of its neighbors would supply energy. It's expensive, it's highly polluting. Israel truly needs, any industrial nation needs, to not be dependent on other countries. That's why we're here. Geologists at the time said that it's conceivable that there is gas down there. God called me and sent me there. I didn't know how or why. I just knew that I'm supposed to help them find the oil. Until you drill, you don't really know it. All I know is I'm just gonna do what he says to do. He tells me to do something, I'm doing it.
You know, when you think about it, you really can't run a modern day economy without available fuel and gas. I mean, for this car specifically, but also for Israel at large. Because we're an island economy, we have a large defense force. We need to have ongoing and available fuel and gas in this country. During the Arab Spring in 2011, the natural gas pipeline from Egypt to Israel was blown up not one, not two, but four separate times, leaving Israel desperate for a reliable source of energy. In the 1970s, regional instability caused the cost of oil to spike more dramatically than ever before in history. This impacted the global economy and especially the United States. Energy independence is hugely important for any country, but in Israel, it's a necessity. We're here because Delik and other companies have discovered a huge, huge amount of gas, mm -hmm. of natural gas, uh, just out that way. If it's been there for so long and no one knew it was there, yeah. there's clearly some kind of like magic or genius that went into the process. I don't know if uh, genius, but like a mix of uh, science and guts and some uh, belief. In the turn of the century, a noble made two modest-sized discoveries. The first discovery, it was about one billion cubic meters, enough to supply about a year or so of uh, gas demand here in Israel. Shortly after, the Mary B field was discovered, and that's a much more significant field. That basically started natural gas here in Israel. But in 2009, we made a much more significant discovery, which was Tamar and that's close to 13 TCF. Okay. So that for decades for to decades. come. So a, lo a lot of gas. A lot of gas. And then a year after we discovered Leviathan and that's twice as large. So six, seven decades in current consumption rates. This was a $3 billion project. But when they talk about future projections of what it's gonna do to our economy, it's, it's enormous. Even five years ago, no one in their right mind would have thought that Israel is going to export petroleum to neighbors. We're now uh, actively exporting to Egypt and to Jordan from Leviathan. That's really significant, uh, not only from an energy perspective, but like geopolitical perspective, that's huge. The discovery of natural gas turned the tides for Israel, making us not only energy independent, but a global powerhouse in the energy sector. Still, natural gas alone is not enough. The world today very much depends on oil, which has yet to be discovered in Israel. But with a little faith, all things are possible. We're on our way to meet uh, Jeffrey, who's the Israeli CEO for Zion Oil and Gas. This is an American-based company. And we're gonna meet him in the Beit She'an Valley. This is sort of through the Jordan Valley in the northern part of Israel. This is a very promising site for finding or oil or gas uh, right inside of Israel. Hey! So this is it, huh? Mati, good how to see you, man? Good, good. Woo. This so, is the place, huh? This is it. This is it, here we are. This is our drilling pad. This is Over where it all happened. Where it happened and it will happen. We're standing here inside the Jordan Valley, or right next to the Jordan Valley. Right. We're standing on a dirt pad. It seems like there's been a lot of work done here. This is a drilling pad. For early drilling operations, you have to have a pad, as you see right here, OK? A few years ago, oh, yeah. there wasn't a centimeter here pretty well that wasn't covered with equipment. We took upon ourselves to conduct uh, 3D survey, 72 kilometers, first time. And what does that show? First time in Israel. What does it show? What's six kilometers under where you're standing right now, right? And that's why we're here right now, because we are on the verge of drilling our new well, right here. Our founder, John Brown, right? None of us would be here right now if it wasn't for him, okay, had the vision, and uh, we've been drilling actively since uh, 2005. That's 15 years. John, thank you again for taking the time. Maybe as a first question, you can start with just sharing the backstory of why you founded Zion Oil and Gas. 
Well, see, years ago, God told me to write the vision. It's in Habakkuk 2, 2, and 3. It's clear. It said, write the vision. It will come to pass. So you have to be persistent. And I didn't know at that point it was a 39-year journey. <laughs> I thought it was a six-month deal. We're going to go over there and get the oil. And I didn't know there was a, a journey, a faith journey that I was going to have to face. But well, that was, I was a new believer, and I thought I was so enthusiastic because, I mean, I had God talk to me, man. You know, and that changed my whole life. So, you know, I left my job down there, you know, and took off to Israel. And it's when I went there is when God gave me that vision at the hotel in Tel Aviv. It's all there. It's blessing of Jacob. This is all you got to do is read it. It's the blessings on the head of Joseph. We're on the head of Joseph of Manasseh. Exactly where he told us the oil was is there. Jeffrey, do you believe we're going to find oil here? I mean, I'm looking around, but there's the borders on our east, on our north, our enemies. We just saw what happened in Beirut. We know what's going further north with ISIS and what happened in Syria. These are our neighbors. You don't choose your neighbors. We are a country that have to have our own resources. The, the world is going on to renewable and everything and such. That's not going to happen tomorrow. Israel truly needs, any industrial nation needs to have and not be dependent on other countries. We did have a huge fund in the Mediterranean mm -hmm. offshore, right? But there are security problems with that. If and when we have a discovery here, this will be onshore, right? And it'll be much better protected. So that's why we're here. So this would be a tool in that direction? Absolutely. We've been blessed with an enormous supply of natural gas. And the discovery of oil looks like it could be just around the corner. As we look to the future, we are turning to another, nearly unlimited source of energy that has existed since the creation of the universe. So, Aran, you get to call this place uh, home every single day, huh? Yeah, it is. It is. It's our second home. Yeah, this is the place. So this is it. This is the power plant. Yeah, this is a Shalim, Plot A. Interesting. As you can see, this is like um, a valley of uh, renewable energy in Israel. Looking into the future, this is one sample of where the country is going. It's a very huge area. We are able to absorb the sun radiation, free energy radiation. And this is sort of like the solar valley of Israel. I mean, you have the three main technologies for harvesting energy from the sun. Can you sort of break down how each one works? We can see we have the PV, we have the trough, and we also have here a storage, which contains the heat in the night when, we, when the sunlight goes down. Fascinating. So, as I mentioned, this is the um, drive pylon. This is the, mm. let's say, the, the machine. This is the engine that moves it. Yeah. The trough track, the sun knows where the sun should be every minute, and it goes from the morning to the sunset. This is one arm. There's another engine for the other arm. Exactly. And we just heard it sort of pivot and rotate. Here, did it again. He knows that he needs to rotate because he's doing a correction every few seconds just to see that he's in the middle of the sun. It's amazing that this is a Jerusalem-based technology here from Israel that's now being used across the world. Yeah, you're right. So this is called the TESS. TESS is Thermal Energy Storage. This is what sets this station apart from other stations. Yes. You have this like buffer of, of stored energy that keeps going and keeps going even when the sun is down. Exactly. So all in all, this part, mm -hmm. the traditional part, this is just a regular power plant. Correct. This part is where the magic is. This is the magic. Because you're just inputting heat into a system. Correct. That's the same as any power plant. The difference is, one, you're getting it from the sun. It doesn't cost any money. Mm -hmm. And two, you have a reserve that's charging when you have a, a surplus of energy, so you can keep running when that energy source is gone. Correct. And all of that without having to input any additional energy. You know, the sun is just endless available energy. And the way you guys have harnessed it and connected it to all the different technologies is truly remarkable, but it also shows how much future there is for this technology. Israel's founding fathers knew that energy independence is necessary for the continuation and survival of Israel and the Jewish people. Decades later, our efforts continue with no signs of slowing down. The whole idea was there was no oil in Israel. And the first thing I saw in Deuteronomy was the land would not lack anything. Oil isn't anything, <laughs> so it wouldn't lack it. As believers, we put our hope in God, knowing that faith is the substance of things hoped for, 
and the assurance of things unseen. We're expecting that we have here a lot of new projects in Israel. We're energy independent, and second, we're exporting, and that's a big boon for Israel. When God put me in Zion Oil and Gas and had me created, people would ask me about this oil, and I'd tell them, you know. And it seemed like there was always a blank look on her face. I would have made in 1981, when I got saved, $200,000 a year. You know how I wound up in 12 years? Working in a Baptist church cleaning toilets for $5 an hour. Remember the brook that God sent Elijah to? He sent the ravens to feed him. He said, I'm gonna send you to the brook. In other words, you go sit and wait, John. And when it comes time, then, you, then you're gonna move when it's my time. This entire place is gonna be filled with all the drilling equipment, and then we're gonna drill, and we are encouraged that we're going to have a discovery. It obviously, it's gonna be a huge impact on Israel. It's a privilege to be living in this country today, and to be able to specifically drill for oil and gas in Israel. <laughs> Loss of words. Every promise that he made, he's gonna keep. Now, because we get tired of waiting, don't mean anything. With us today, we have somebody very, very special, Dr. Colonel Eran Lerman. He was the Deputy Director of National Security Council for the Prime Minister. Shalom and welcome to our studio. Shalom, sir. Let me first of all remind uh, our, viewers. our viewers that uh, our late Prime Minister, great Golda, Golda May, used to pull uh, uh, the, the tail of the great prophet Moses. She yeah. used to say, great, great leader, prophet, lousy navigator. 40 years <laughs> in the desert, we end up in the only part of the region which has no oil. Well, turns out Moses knew more than she did That's because probably. we do have quite a lot of energy, but it's offshore. You open the sea, you go down, there's plenty of that. And to really be effective in exporting, we need to team up with Egypt and Cyprus and countries on the uh, uh, other side of the Mediterranean in Europe who would be the gate to the European market. January 2019, there was a meeting in Cairo of the energy ministers of seven countries that came together, seven entities, Italy, Greece, Cyprus, Egypt, Israel, and Jordan, and the Palestinians. In the middle of all the conflicts, and here were seven countries, and since then we have been joined by France, which is very strongly standing with us. We have a, a community, an, a, not an alliance, but an alignment of countries that want to make good use of these energy resources. And if we build one pipeline common to Egypt, Cyprus, and Israel, we can take our product to Europe. The problem is that we are running into a conflict with Turkey. And Turkey is led by a party which is Islamist in nature. It wants to reverse the secularization of Turkish society. We have to remember, uh, when American uh, pilgrims sailed to uh, Massachusetts, uh, the Ottoman Empire was the most powerful nation on earth. And now Erdogan is trying to build this glory again. He is pushing an Islamist agenda. He hates the government in Egypt because they kicked out the Muslim Brotherhood. He hates Israel because of Jerusalem. He hates the Greeks because of all Turkish grievances, and he's trying to push the borders of Turkey so as to block mm -hmm. Israel, Egypt, and Cyprus. Do you see, because of our finding of gas, we took a different place in the table? Well, we are certainly by now a, a country that is no longer dependent on uh, foreign energy. We can become a significant exporter combined with the transformation of Israel within the last generation from an economic basket case into one of the world leading centers of innovation, high tech, AI. That's fulfillment of prophecy, that God brought the people of Israel and God is blessing the people of Israel, that Israel will be a light to the nation. When That's... I read this famous line, there will be men, old men and women and children playing in the streets, streets of, of Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Well, it is city, it's a city it's of definitely. nearly a million people. Yeah. Uh, it, the prophecy is alive. The miracle of the return of the Jewish people. Thank you very much. You're welcome.
When we talk about the future of Israel's energy grid, that story cannot be told without speaking with Yosef Abramovich. He's this country's founding father of solar energy. We had moved from Boston to a small kibbutz in the Arava Desert, the third most extreme desert in the world. When we got out of the van, it was the end of the day, and the van's air conditioned. We opened the doors, and it was like, oh my god, hit. We are just hit. And I say, oh, I'm sure the whole place works on solar. And of course it didn't, and when I understood that nobody was going to do it, I said, this I'm going to do. And I thought it was going to be easy. <laughs> Clearly it wasn't. Yeah. We need to come up with a business model called the Arava Company. But it was the first, and the first always the hardest in every market. Plus, I was just hit with this crazy vision. Wow. Wouldn't it be cool if we got the whole mm -hmm. area, the south of the country, from the Red Sea to the Dead Sea, to go 100% daytime solar by 2020? Like, I was just, like, on fire about that. And everyone, again, was just like... Yeah, it's not gonna happen. It's, 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 it's technically not feasible, financially it's not feasible. So you built this first field, yeah. and you're somehow victorious. <laughs> what was the battle to get this approved? What was the battle to get through the, the red tape on this, on this project? So the state would essentially, the first megawatts would have to essentially be subsidized to be able to jumpstart an entire industry. So you can understand some objection. There's no technical expertise in the country. The yeah. gas companies, everybody tried and no one could break through. And I think because we were coming from a place of values, because we wanted to do something majestic and good for the environment as well, we, they reluctantly gave us like uh, a pass when they opened the doors just a little bit. Did you see a substantial shift in the way people look the, the notion of clean or green energy after this happened or during the process? Was there something click we, in the, we in the saw heads of people? Really clearly, 14 years later, <laughs> in other words, today. Today, we're celebrating a whole year that this is the first region in the world to be 100% solar powered during the day. Amazing. Yosef and his team had to do everything from raising capital to lobbying for changes to Israeli energy laws. In the process, the minds and hearts of Israeli leaders were opened and they welcomed solar energy to this country. But Yosef didn't stop there. So there are 600 million people in Africa without access to power. And the population of the continent is gonna double in one generation. Wow. Most important value to me is that we're all created in God's image. And that therefore we're all endowed with the right to dignity. The dignity of real education, can't have it without power. Dignity of healthcare, the dignity of a job and a growing economy mm -hmm. that, that, that needs to be able to create these jobs. None of it is possible without electricity. In the Bible, in the Garden of Eden, God creates a beautiful universe and gifts it to humanity to work it and to also guard it. So what's stronger than partnering with an orphan youth village and having that income cover uh, all the healthcare costs plus, you know, for 500 orphans, so it's all, it's all connected. This is the, like, uh, um, I'm actually, um, I don't ask for words. Yosef is someone who practices what he preaches. His own nuclear family reflects his desire to impact those in need. Together with his wife Susan, Yosef raised five children, two of whom were adopted from Ethiopia and given a renewed chance to thrive in the Promised Land. Because when someone's life mission is based on biblical values, their business ventures and their private life are often indistinguishable. Hey, I'm Mati Shoshani, and thank you for watching the TBN Israel YouTube channel. We hope this video gave you greater understanding of Israel and her people. If you haven't already, subscribe to our channel and hit the notification bell so you never miss a video. We'd love to hear from you, so be sure to share what you've learned and ask your questions and comments below. And invite your friends to join the conversation.